Dear diary, today will be different. It has to be. I shouldn't have come home. I know the risk, but I have to know her. I will no longer be the sad little girl who lost her parents. I will start fresh. For the first time in a long time, I feel completely and undeniably wide awake. For the first time in a long time, I feel good. But how do I stop a monster without becoming one myself? For once, I don't regret the day before it begins. I welcome the day. Because, because I, I know I will, I will see, see her again. again. The genesis of this project is actually kind of kismet, I think, more than anything else. Julie Pleck and I were having lunch with Jennifer Breslow, who was the CW executive, and we were sitting around going, what are we going to do? I said, God, I love vampires. I, I would do a vampire show in a heartbeat if I thought that anybody would still do a vampire show after all these vampire shows. As much as they were intrigued, they responded with skepticism. Do we want to look like we're riding somebody else's coattails? I didn't necessarily want to do vampires, but I wanted to do um, something, you know, something sexy. And I think vampires are incredibly sexy. Jen, who was an executive at the CW, said, well, we want to do a vampire show, and we have this property that doesn't have a writer that we've been wanting to put together. Do you guys want to do it? I don't even know why I said yes. It just seemed like the right thing to do at the right time. Something about it made me want to be a part of it. And I wanted to work with Julie, and I wanted to work with the CW again. The process for this show is really intense, and it was sort of um, fight to the end, really high stakes. People wanted this television show. We're so lucky. The show is really great. We have Julie and Kevin Williamson, who are brilliant. The minute I heard it was Vampire Diaries, Kevin Williamson. That's kind of all I really needed to hear. We got the job because Kevin Williamson decided he wanted to do a show for the CW, really. I just was kind of along for the ride. I mean, he, he sort of was the pioneer of the teen television genre. They had about two weeks to write the pilot script, which is unheard of. Julie and I sat at a kitchen table for like two weeks and we pounded it out. It was the most speedy and as a result kind of harmonious process we could have had. We just connected, we clicked when we were writing it and it just sort of happened without us. Do you know what I mean? It was just sort of a really easy thing. We wrote the script, we got picked up to pilot, we shot the pilot, we edited it, we hired writers, we started shooting, we had a series and we've been going ever since. I think Kevin and Julie, as creators of the show, have come up with a lot of different elements uh, to appeal to a, a wide range of people. The writers do such a beautiful job blending um, this crazy world of vampires and this just real world of what it is to be like in high school. Add to that life and death stakes, and wow. When you add a genre element into the world of a small town drama, of a teen drama, Suddenly everything just seems more profound. It has more substance, it has more power. What sets the Vampire Diaries apart is literally the human relationships in the show. It's more about the town of Mystic Falls and the history and everything that's happened in this town and how it affects the town's people than it is about just the vampires. You're dealing with romance and love. And betrayal and hatred and envy and anything you can really think of that goes on with human emotions happens in this show and there's vampires in it. What The Vampire Diaries is about is love is eternal, and that's a universal and timeless theme. We always said in the pilot, it's a girl who feels dead inside and a boy who is dead inside and how they bring each other back to life. I met a girl. We talked. It was epic. Kevin Williamson has had such a reputation for, for his witty banter, uh, grown-up dialogue for teenagers. Kevin has this like amazing ability to uh, write dialogue that is so easily spoken uh, by an actor. He actually makes it really easy for us. To experience the different range of emotions as an actor is, is uh, more than you could ever wish for. They just flow and everything, you know, sort of like melds together beautifully. Kevin Williamson has these iconic lines, these like one-liners, like with um, Caroline when she's like, I have an idea, let's have a seance. I don't think that's a good idea. Come on, now let's summon some spirits. And this Emily chick has some serious explaining to do. I try to stay away from sort of that scream voice of so everything's a reference or sort of this sort of self-referential or even the Dawson's Creek voice where everything is psychobabble. You know, that was sort of unique to that. But I do want the characters in Mystic Falls to actually live in the real world. Kevin definitely brings in a lot of pop culture references and he also has this great ability 
to have the characters make fun of themselves. I think it makes the audience be able to relate to it because they think that this could be a real school in Mystic Falls, Virginia, and these kids are very aware of what I'm aware of. You want it to feel like it's in the real world because then you feel like it's real, it's really happening, and these are real kids, and they're really in this situation. Our show and our characters live in the now. They're very much aware of the vampire phenomenon that's out there. How come you don't sparkle? Because I live in the real world where vampires burn in the sun. Ah, oh, Miss Anne Rice, she was so honored. I feel like we had to acknowledge it, just to let our audience know our characters live in the real world. If, if you encountered a real-life vampire, wouldn't the first thing you'd be is like, he kind of looks like Edward. This book, by the way, has it all wrong. We'd been told by the writers that the book series was going to be a beautiful skeleton for the show, but it wasn't necessarily going to define you know, what was going to happen, who was going to be with who, who was going to turn into what. Our show is derived from this series of books, but we're obviously not going by the books at all. We're just taking certain characters and then making our own little world of the Vampire Diaries, with all due respect to what L.J. Smith created. I could add my personal take to it, but at the same time, honor what was there. I think the most important aspects that have transferred from books to show uh, would be the essence of the characters. Some things just don't translate as well from the book to the series, and you have to make changes so that it works for the TV show. It's always a balancing act. H how far from the books can you get? I think the very first decision that we made when we started breaking out how we were going to tell the story from book to TV show was to change Elena's Ooh. little sister. Jeremy, I know who you are, and it's not this person. Elena, in the books, has a four-year-old sister, and which then turned into a 16-year-old troubled boy. I was about to read the books until I found out my character was originally a four-year-old girl named Margaret. Uh, so I figured that wouldn't affect my character all too much. <laughs> you know, some people were a little frustrated with that when they first saw the show because Margaret pay played a very key role in the books and that Margaret was the one who invited Damon into the house for the first time. You know, it's a pain in the butt to have a four-year-old character on the show. And we also needed more men. There wasn't enough guys in the show that weren't vampires. So that's why we added the, the brother character of Jeremy. Ah, God, what now? One of the concerns that the network and studio had with regards to the book was that Elena was a little unlikable. Elena in the books was kind of a bitchy mean girl, I guess is the best way to put it. In the books, Elena's sort of that queen bee, popular girl, gets what she wants whenever she wants it. That was one of our concerns. You can't have a pilot episode and dislike your lead lady. You can't, you know, you have to like your heroine instantly. If I had to characterize her like that from the beginning, I don't think anybody would have cared as much about the love story. I want you to keep this that way. You'll know if you're ever in danger. We're really kept in the dark. And I think it's because with the writers, things change constantly. I think they're really, I think they have their definite through line. But I, you know, I think that with a show like this, new ideas pop up all the time. You just trust that they've got it going. They know what's happening and that, that it's, it unfolds as it should. And that you can, as an actor, you can creatively surrender to that process and trust it. We don't even know where it's going to go. <laughs> we usually find out what's going on right before we start the next episode. Uh, which is fun. It keeps us on our toes. I cannot wait until we get the new scripts. I mean, I read one and I want to see what's going on next and what happens next, and I just get so excited. We all do. They've literally had to put scripts on lockdown um, <laughs> from us trying to sneak into them before they're perfected and ready for us. If we get excited, I can imagine how everyone else is feeling and how hard it is to wait for the next episode, because I can barely wait for the next episode. <sighs> Three, two, one, go. Hey, there you are. Um, have you been down to the falls yet? They're really cool at night. You mean it's not gonna happen. Sorry. And cut. The very first thing that you have to do when you're putting a pilot together is hire your director. We had one that we were circling. But I gotta tell you, I just wasn't sold. We kind of kept saying, gosh, you know, this, the person that we hire is so important. We just want someone who is ex who is as excited about it as we are. Hey, Marcos. Yeah. So three, two, one, and then go, and I look. You're That's looking this way. Go. I'm gonna see the transformation, then you turn and go, wow. Got it, yeah. got it, got it. Don't be afraid to even just project that. Yeah, absolutely, okay, okay yeah. yeah. My involvement in the project just kind of all happened last minute. I read in the trades that Kevin Williamson was doing this project, Vampire Diaries. Marcos is 
incredible and we're so lucky to have him. He sat down and said, you gotta hire me, I wanna do this show. It's just so romantic. And it was like the first thing out of his mouth. And Julie, you could just see her swooning. I mean, basically, it was it was that easy for me. I sort of came from a place of the romance on the show and not the dark, creepy element of vampires. And I said, at, at its heart, the show needs to have some emotional weight to it. And he kept talking and talking. And everything he talked about, it all led back to the love story. Then I switched, switched over and said, but it could be scary, too. <laughs> Probably the best hire of Kevin's and mine's entire career, without a doubt. He's our other partner. You know, everyone sort of like says Kevin and Julie, Kevin and Julie, but it's Kevin, Julie, and Marcos. He was the third partner of the show, without a doubt. He really set such a beautiful tone for the show that made that first episode what it was, and I think started this incredible journey. For me as a filmmaker, I get to create that world. I get to decide what the series is going to look like and feel like. And once Kevin and Julie were on board with my pitch, then I just got to do it. So that was fun. Really good. Now give me one with the mouth open. You mean to do anything else? No. It's good. You'll open your mouth here. Yeah. And turn. And action. One more like that. He has a relationship with the cast that is so great. Marco Siega, who's supervising director, takes care of all of this over here. He's like their brother, their buddy, their dad. Their, um, their stern teacher. As a director, I can see them in a way that they can't see themselves. I'm working with them and I, and I can notice their little tics and their habits. If we have questions, we can usually go to Marcos and he'll try to <laughs> maneuver them for us. I think that's gonna happen first. Okay. And then you'll what come over, you yeah. I just need it to be a bit more frenetic, so let's rehearse it once. Yeah. He's everything that you could want somebody to be in a position of creative leadership because he gets them and they listen to him and he really is very personally and emotionally connected to them. It may be actually that he says his line before you call for an ambulance because you have to see that she needs an ambulance. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. I'm going to bring in another extra here okay. and you're going to say, give her space and push somebody away. Okay. On this show, we talk about the flaws and we talk about the problems and we've yet to have a situation where they haven't agreed willingly to confront and, and tackle a problem that I think is apparent. You're only as strong as your weakest link, and I think that is how, how everyone approaches working on this show. There's a lot of young kids you know, on board who, who are really focused and really care about doing the work, which is, which is so nice to, to be involved in. They want to be better, and they want to be the cast that people look at and go, they're really good. They don't want to be the soapy show that have pretty people who can't act. People die around you. How could it not matter? It matters and you know it. You need to leave. Your wounds are bleeding and you need to leave. I would love when, when kids are flipping through the channels and they, they come past a show, they're like, oh, I know what that is. You know, it has its own, its 